introduction to the whole issue of statistics uh, in medicine. Uh, so some of this may be familiar to you, and if it is, um, uh, I apologize. Okay, if you had been, many of you uh, work uh, in medical practice, if you had begun your careers in the early 19th century, one of the things that, one of the things that would have been uh, most striking to you uh, would have been the fact that you were dealing with an enormous amount of uncertainty and particularly uh, therapeutic uncertainty. So you would have been struck by the uncertainty of medical results, particularly therapeutic results, and the underlying reason for it would have been the fundamental subjectivity of almost everything that was going on. First of all, most of what a physician would know would be based on uh, uh, patient uh, accounts, which are inherently subjective, or on physician observations, which can be equally uh, subjective. And one of the key themes uh, in medical history since the 19th century has been reducing uncertainty by inducing levels of uh, subjectivity. And increasingly in the 19th century, uh, doctors and medical researchers have sought objective signs uh, of disease. The most compelling of these uh, were probably anatomical lesions that could be seen uh, in post-mortem uh, dissections, but uh, these kinds of uh, uh, objective signs could be anything from x-rays, uh, microscopic, uh, uh, microscopic slides, laboratory tests, uh, mechanical means uh, of measuring, and various other sorts uh, of numbers uh, measuring therapy. And that's really what I'd like to talk about uh, today. So we're going to go back to the first half of the 19th century to three innovations that are usually associated with uh, the Paris Clinic uh, of the early 19th century. We've, we've since learned that these weren't just Parisian innovations. These were most, more general innovations that could be seen uh, in most of the great medical centers of Europe. But nonetheless, the scope uh, of what was going on in Paris uh, makes the identification with Paris medicine uh, more or less uh, acceptable. The first one is pathological anatomy, which was the correlation uh, of uh, symptoms uh, during life with pathological lesions discovered uh, during post-mortem dissections, which led to the uh, uh, recognition uh, of a large number uh, of disease entities. Uh, a second one was, exp was animal experimentation, uh, which was done uh, with some frequency uh, in Paris in the early 19th century, and which led primarily uh, to uh, physiology, the development of experimental physiology. And the third one is quantification, probably the major, I say the only one, but uh, let me qualify and say it's the major uh, uh, innovation which had actual uh, therapeutic uh, relevance. So what caused the shift in perspective and the, this development uh, of these new ways of seeing? Well, one very standard argument uh, is that in post-revolutionary France, um, the two separate professions of surgery uh, and of internal medicine uh, were unified uh, in a single medical school so that the practical anatomical orientation of surgeons was combined with the more theoretical uh, orientation uh, of internal physicians. Uh, 
Uh, a second uh, conventional explanation, and it's certainly very true, is the sheer availability of large numbers of poor patients in urban hospitals that could be observed and to some degree uh, experimented on. And the numbers really were very great. The Parisian hospital system was a unified system uh, which made thousands of patients uh, available to potential clinical researchers. One of the points that I've made in, in previous books is that uh, Paris was one, was one of uh, the first places where you begin to get large communities uh, of clinical researchers who are seeking to uh, advance medical knowledge and are publishing uh, about their medical knowledge. And finally, you get new ideals of scientific objectification. You begin to see in discussions people talking about evidence and empirical ri rigor and the need to have large numbers of cases in order to make uh, generalizations. So going back to uh, the issue of uh, therapeutic counting, uh, let me just mention one of the most famous uh, and earliest cases of therapeutic counting, uh, which is uh, James, uh, James Lynn's uh, uh, experiments, uh, uh, controlled experiments on scurvy. Although it was only done on 12 patients, it's usually considered uh, the first uh, prospective controlled experiment which tested six different uh, 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 treatments uh, for uh, treating scurvy. But by the 19th century, so by the 19th century counting was not new and Professor Truller and some of our other uh, speakers are going to talk about other 18th century uh, developments, for instance, um, that uh, immunization uh, created uh, a lot of statistics uh, about uh, effectiveness. So counting was not new, but in the early 19th century, uh, it was presented as a methodological innovation uh, by one of the, the major figures of uh, Paris uh, pathological anatomy and, and hospital medicine uh, generally, uh, Pierre-Charles uh, Louis, uh, and he presented it as an uh, innovation that was at least equivalent to that of uh, anatomical lesions. And the idea was to systematically count the incidences of success or failure of a therapy in order to determine, uh, to determine whether it was effective or not. And it was presented as a method of objective uh, judgment. And it provoked an enormous amount uh, of controversy, in part because people didn't like his conclusions. Uh, uh, his major book was about bloodletting, uh, and uh, which was an extremely popular uh, uh, treatment uh, in early 19th century uh, French medicine. But it also had other problems, much more basic problems, which 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 uh, critics. Uh, were quick uh, to point out. First of all, results varied. Different observers frequently came out with very different uh, results. One of Louis' competitors, J.B. Uh, Bouillot, uh, another very, very well-known uh, Parisian professor and hospital phys physician, showed extremely good quantitative results uh, by using massive bloodletting, not kind of the minor bloodletting that was associated with leeches, but by massively uh, 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 bloodletting uh, patients uh, with fevers, and he's, his results were wonderful. His results were absolutely wonderful. A second problem is it was not clear what exactly the units were that were being counted, because even though the notion of disease as a generalized imbalance of the body was being overtaken by the notion of specific disease entities, 19th century physicians were extremely aware of the highly individual nature of diseases. That even the same disease in different individuals could present differently, could react very, very differently uh, to therapies, uh, and the therapies could actually be administered uh, in very, very 
uh, different ways. And in fact, the very art of medicine was precisely to be able to choose, was to be able to evaluate the patient and to choose the kind of therapy that was most, that best suited the particular problems uh, uh, of, of the patient. So quantification seemed to go against what the essential function uh, of the physician was and raised a really serious question about what in fact was the role of physicians. Now physicians didn't talk about cookbook medicine the way some physicians began talking in the early 21st century, but they pretty much said the same thing. They pretty much said that this would lead to a kind of a mechanical application uh, that went against everything that uh, medicine uh, was about. A very small number of people, most physicians had very, very little uh, mathematical knowledge, but there were a few, uh, like Jules Gavaret, who had actually uh, uh, was, a, was, was, was a graduate of the École Polytechnique uh, and an engineer and had very, very sophisticated mathematical skills. And he pointed out that using averages was a really simplistic way of trying to figure out uh, therapeutic efficacy. Most physicians didn't have that, that sophistication, but they understood that the results did not necessarily, that counting did not necessarily lead to unambiguous results. And of course, there was then Claude Bernard's very sophisticated uh, critique of counting um, in his book on experimental medicine, where he argued that counting did not produce certainty. It only produced some understanding of probabilities, which was an ex not only an inferior way of knowing, but was totally inapplicable to individual patients. Knowing that 50% of patients might respond to a treatment didn't help you decide what treatment to give to uh, an individual patient. Um, as one example of this kind of criticism, the very famous case of Semmelweis's uh, data on, um, quantified data on improved um, uh, mortality when doctors washed uh, before childbirth has often conventionally been presented as, well, doctors didn't want to accept that they had a role uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, spreading illness. But if you look at some of the discussions about Semmelweis' statistics, they're actually sound uh, fairly sophisticated. One of the arguments was that in a normal hospital, childbirth statistics, uh, mortality rates in childbirth varied tremendously from season to season, uh, depending on who was doing it. There was a normal variation in mortality, and therefore, this kind of statistics that Semmelweis was presenting did not appear particularly uh, convincing. Well, in spite of this, um, uh, in spite of the fact that simple counting of therapeutic results by individual doctors was largely inadequate in many, perhaps most, situations for producing conclusive results, this didn't prevent doctors from utilizing it routinely during the second half of the 19th century and the early years uh, of the 20th century. For one thing, keeping records that could eventually uh, be quantified uh, could be easily incorporated into normal uh, practice routines, uh, into the administrative routines uh, of hospitals and in fact served as a kind of extension of practical uh, medical judgment. If you look at medical discussions and medical debates about a variety of controversial issues, you see that statistics were frequently used. They were rarely enough to convince people uh, of anything. Um, as is true today, you could always find reasons why the statistics, why there was something wrong with the statistics, uh, either methodologically or, 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 or how they were used. But in combination with other forms of, me of evidence, uh, anatomical, physiological, individual case observations, counting was one tool of clinical judgment that might be taken into account in making clinical decisions uh, about therapies. Incidentally, one of the areas where it was used most successfully was in surgery. 
And the reason it could be used most successfully in surgery is because very often what you were counting was survival or death. And unlike internal medicine, where cure, improvement, are kind of highly ambiguous concepts, death is pretty concrete. That, by the way, that didn't prevent uh, uh, objections. Uh, the, the first discussions about tracheotomy, the statistics on tracheotomy, argued that the reason why, st why, why there was so much less death in tracheotomy was because tracheotomy was being done so early that many of the children who were surviving would not have reached the stage of respir respir respiratory failure uh, that, that uh, in, in, in other words, where tracheotomy was being done. So you could always find a way out of it, but nonetheless, my argument would be that a certain kind of quantification became a routine part of um, uh, certainly clinical medicine and certainly surgery. By the early uh, 20th century, um, problems began to accumulate. Medicine was becoming uh, much more scientific, but therapy was not. And making that worse was the fact that many, many new therapies were being developed uh, in the early 20th century. Some of these were great innovations, like diphtheria, antitoxin, and insulin. But many of them were not. Many of them were, there were huge numbers of questionable therapeutic substances, all kinds of machines that were being created by an emerging uh, pharmaceutical uh, and tech uh, industry, uh, delivering electricity, massage, uh, etc. Even uh, uh, x-rays as a, as, a, as, a, as a form uh, of therapy. And they were making all sorts of claims. And as, as, as has been argued, this threatened to taint doctors with the commercialism of the drug industry. So the problem was, how do you evaluate innovations objectively? And there were basically a number of choices. The first choice was the traditional method. Individual clinicians tested new products and procedures. If they had successes, they might write about it. They might, if they were uh, teachers, they might tell their students about it. And innovations spread in that way. By the early 20th century, this kind of uh, individual clinician testing became somewhat more formalized so that when insulin, for instance, uh, was being tested. It was sent out to a number of specialist uh, academic clinics where it was not just tested for efficacy, but for, for, do for uh, the, the most effective dosage and the best way to actually uh, bring the therapy uh, to patients. A second thing, uh, a second way of doing it was organized evaluation uh, of therapies in 1938. The Food and Drug Administration uh, was reorganized and began to be responsible for uh, evaluating uh, uh, therapies. And by the 1920s, uh, 30s, and 40s, you begin to get local trials using controls uh, of various sorts of, or, or another. Some of you who uh, may have read the book Aerosmith uh, by Sinclair Lewis has as its penultimate chapter uh, a clinical test that the hero is doing in some island in the Caribbean. And it's really very interesting. In the book that was written uh, in 1925, the control is another town. There are two towns on this island, and one of these towns is going to get this experimental therapy, and an another one isn't. Three years later, which shows you just how quickly this spread, three years later the movie came out, and instead of having different towns, the, random, the, the, uh, uh, the, the control was alternating patients. One patient in every two was given the experimental uh, drug. So it gives you an idea of how quickly this kind uh, 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 of, of testing uh, spread. And finally, by the 1940s and the, the, the Second World War and the need to uh, quickly uh, decide uh, about the effectiveness uh, of antibiotics, uh, began, you, begin, you begin to see large multi-centered uh, trials um, 
which were centrally planned but uh, locally uh, administered. And they provide a much larger number of cases, um, and in theory at least they were run according to common protocols uh, and techniques. So, we now come to randomized clinical trials, which uh, required two things in order to be effective. The first thing that they required is new forms of knowledge, particularly statistical techniques. And the other thing that they required is new forms of social organization. So let me talk a little bit about the new forms of knowledge. I won't really uh, emphasize this. Some of the key tools were developed uh, statistical tools were developed by Carl Pearson, who is probably most famous uh, as a central figure and founder of the eugenics movement uh, in Great Britain. Uh, R.A. Fisher, who developed the notion of randomization, which for him was strictly a statistical technique uh, for dealing uh, uh, with variations, with, with variations in large numbers, but which clinicians who didn't really understand statistics understood as a, in a different way, uh, as a way of overcoming uh, bias by doctors uh, and patients which might influence results. And in fact, uh, the person who probably did most to develop standard methodology trials, Austin, uh, Austin Bradford Hill, uh, who did the, the streptomycin uh, clinical trials, um, uh, it's been argued, I think, f effectively by Ian Chalmers, uh, used randomization in the very standard clinical way uh, as a way of uh, beating bias rather than uh, uh, for statistical, technical, uh, statistical reasons. Uh, Hill, by the way, pl also plays a role, a major role in the development uh, of risk factor epidemiology. Uh, the two forms of the epidemiology which have had such an extraordinary influence uh, on the development uh, of contemporary uh, medicine. Until the 1960s, there were relatively few clinical trials uh, using uh, uh, controls, uh, proper statistical methods, double-blind randomization, uh, but quite quickly all this changed uh, and by the 1980s, they were widely accepted as the gold standard uh, of research. Now, there were all kinds of problems with them. People had all kinds of, uh, doctors particularly, uh, had all kinds of uh, objections. Uh, one of them is that randomization seemed to be a roll of the dice. I remember coming here, coming to McGill in 1978, and one of the first papers that I heard was by a sociologist from the University of Toronto, which was about how doctors hated randomization because they thought that they knew what effective therapies were and they were unwilling to put their patients through this kind of process of randomization because even experimental therapy seemed better than uh, nothing. Nonetheless, RCT spread and by 1980s are uh, uh, indispensable, but unfortunately they're also very complex and very lengthy and unsuited to moments of great crisis, which the AIDS crisis was, and as many of you know, the AIDS activists uh, were successful, at least in the case of AIDS <coughs> testing, in changing the normal course uh, of testing. Now, clinical trials are extremely complicated. Um, I've, I've, I'm, I'm sparing you some organograms uh, that I sometimes show in order to describe the complexity of clinical trials. But what's really interesting is that it's become a private industry. They're so complicated that you need specialized private uh, businesses to actually do this in many cases because the knowledge and infrastructure that's required is very, very difficult to, um, uh, to accumulate. Okay, so we know that there are numerous problems uh, in random clinical trials. Trials are very expensive. We know they're often funded by drug companies. We know that there are all kinds of abuses that are uh, associated with them. Uh, there's publication bias. And there have been a variety of attempted solutions, uh, registration of clinical trials so that 
uh, even if results aren't published, um, people have some idea of unpublished results. Uh, conflict of interest statements, which may or may not make any difference in, in um, controlling uh, these kind, uh, uh, the kinds of abuses that they are meant uh, to try to control. Um, controversies inevitably result when results go against uh, established practice. Uh, constant uh, statistics on breast cancer screening uh, very rarely uh, convinces the physicians who are dealing um, with the women involved or the women themselves. Almost everyone who has had a case where they have discovered uh, breast cancer through screening is convinced that, a, that lives have been saved. And you can find all kinds of reasons for discounting the statistics ranging from the inadequacy uh, of the machinery uh, to uh, the competence of the person uh, reading, uh, uh, reading uh, the, the uh, x-ray. There is now uh, an added problem of who gets included in tests. Uh, uh, children, women, minorities were originally excluded from testing for a wide variety of reasons. Now we have regulations about who has to be included in tests. And this, of course, makes recruitment for testing far more difficult uh, than, than it, it ought to be. Um, there are all kinds of legal and ethical issues. An, an, an early issue was about the use of placebo trials. That seems to have been largely overcome, except perhaps, I don't know, the case of surgery, uh, Shams surgery. Uh, I'm not sure whether that one has been totally resolved. But now the issue has become rather different. Now the issue has become uh, testing in developing countries, and there's a lot of concern about the ethics uh, of testing, much of which is taking place uh, in places where there is little regulatory uh, control over what is going on. And finally, the results of, of, of RCTs are often inconclusive, either because differences are very small or because different tests have contradictory results. So now we have to have another layer uh, of analysis, uh, originally consensus conferences, now meta-analyses, that try to make sense of the contradictory results uh, or the conflicting results that often result from RCTs. And plus, added to this is the well-known fact that doctors very frequently ignore even clear results uh, of RCTs. And one response of this has been uh, the evidence-based medicine movement, the notion that practice should be based on not so much random clinical trials now, but at least on meta-analyses uh, of randomized clinical trials. I won't say much about this, because I'm sure you know a great deal about it. I will only point out that this comes out of McMaster University's epidemiology department. And originally, it was meant to add to a physician's autonomy by getting physicians to actually read the medical literature uh, efficiently. The problem was, of course, that most doctors don't have the time to actually read the, uh, uh, the medical literature. So the result is uh, huge numbers uh, of uh, guidelines. And we now have so many guidelines that there are guidelines to the production of guidelines. Um, okay, so let me just uh, conclude this by saying a number of things. Back in the early days when evidence-based medicine uh, was at its most polemical and ideological and it convinced that it was revolutionizing uh, uh, medicine, one of, the, uh, one of the responses was that it was essentially a return to Pierre Louis's uh, quantification uh, and nothing more. It was old French wine in a Canadian bottle. Um, and in fact, the criticisms that you, begin, that you saw in the 1990s and early 2000s were almost exactly the same as the criticisms that you saw in the 1830s about Louis. They had to do with the fact that counting didn't take account of individual uh, variation because it was uh, population-based. 
Um, it was argued that it was dogmatic, it was arbitrary. Uh, the validity of, daint of, of data was tainted by publication bias, etc., etc. Uh, it was much less scientific than defenders claimed, and I think most tellingly, its own effectiveness uh, had never actually uh, been proven. Plus, the theorization of it, uh, and I can tell you this from having read a lot of the early uh, e EBM stuff, was extremely weak. It was extremely weak and very, very unsophisticated for anybody um, uh, who knows, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the more theoretical literature uh, on uh, uh, medical knowledge and evidence. In spite of all these weaknesses, um, I think all of the students that I deal with uh, in, at McGill, and I deal with fourth year medical students who are getting ready to go out to practice, pretty much accept uh, evidence-based medicine. They're very realistic about it. They understand its weaknesses at least as well uh, as, as, as we do, but it's there. It's there uh, as a basis, and it will, in my view, undoubtedly survive because there is a need for, authorita uh, for authoritative methods uh, f to evaluate uh, evidence, and this overrides any recognized methodological weaknesses, especially since Nothing better uh, is being proposed. But there is one big spoiler potentially uh, in this, and that is the great hope of going beyond population thinking to actual, actual scientifically based therapy uh, of individuals. And that, of course, is therapy based on genetics. And this represents a form of scientific objectification um, that supposedly uh, takes account uh, of individual differences and, does, and that does not try to extrapolate from huge uh, population differences. So with that, um, I end and thank you for listening. Questions? Yes. Thanks. So, so you started the talk in France, and then we migrated over to, you know, the UK, and then we ended up uh, more or less in North America. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, I mean, it seems that oftentimes when people describe EBM, it's described as a distinctly Anglo phenomenon. You've got the most of the statisticians, uh, most of the statistical apparatus that we use, were developed in the UK, it was championed in Canada, et cetera. But I'm wondering what the reception is, what the relationship is with the kind of statistical approach to medicine back in the old country, back in France, back in, in, in Germany, whether it's a different relationship. Because it, it strikes me, I, I guess it strikes me that the, the, the contemporary tools, even though you started in, the, in, in, in France, the contemporary tools are basically tools that were developed out of Anglo statistical thinking. So, my, I mean, there has not, there, there actually has been, um, the, the, no, there actually has not been a huge amount of work in non Anglo Saxon countries, but there has been some. Um, and certainly in the case of France, uh, I would say that the French were rather late. Uh, in uh, accepting uh, a lot of these things. A, a lot of the arguments that uh, uh, American doctors made, the French made much more vehemently uh, and with much greater success. Um, eventually, these things were accepted for a number of reasons, partly because North American medicine is the standard for the world. Uh, and secondly, because uh, European medicine uh, is highly regulated and, uh, by governments who uh, perceive this uh, as a way of trying to control largely uncontrollable therapeutic action. Some of this was financial, for sure. Uh, people actually, they were wrong, it turned out. They thought that you could save money 
by, 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 you know, by choosing uh, the best therapies. It turns out that it's much more expensive, actually, to follow guidelines than not to follow guidelines. But it, it was more than that. It's, it was about bringing some kind of administrative and regulatory order to a wild area where people were doing all kinds of different things and where variation was the rule. So uh, diminishing uh, uh, variation was a large part uh, of what, um, what was going on. So, but, so the answer is that I think Europe has come to this, but it came to it rather late uh, and with a good deal more uh, reservations than, than, than uh, the, the Anglo-Saxon world, the, the English-speaking world. Hey, I, may come, I, I may come in for Germany and it came even, well, it came very late. And that all the objective, uh, objections which you listed, um, and the Germ one of the German reasons was that um, they have naturopathy, you see. Homeopathy is very strong rooted in, fr in, in Germany. And they had a lobby and so on. And even in, when the new Arzneimittelgesetz uh, came up, this was all accepted, and, and, and evidence-based medicine was uh, opposed very strongly and effectively. Yeah. Now it's more or less accepted, but even more or less because the, there is a German Cochrane Center, and the head is now even a professor. But he, I remember very well the faculty meeting. It happened to be in my university, and yeah. And, and, and I remember very well a colleague saying, well, that's not science, you see. I mean, just, just, just one, one quick, uh, quick point. I mean, I, I spent last year in, in Germany, and I was told that, uh, you know, here, here in North America, evidence-based is the prefix you put in front of every, everything you care about, evidence-based policy, evidence-based medicine. Evidence and I was told in, in Germany, so I, you know, I trucked this out as a good North American, and I was told, we don't, we don't like evidence-based that has negative connotations for us. Yeah, <laughs> um, yes, please. One, one of the important issues in counting is the memory of the counter. And I can recall Rock Robertson, I don't know if that name is familiar to people in this room, but Rock Robertson uh, came from Vancouver to uh, Montreal. He became professor head of surgery at the first year, the general of McGill, eventually became dean, at least the principal of McGill University. And at a Royal College lecture, he gave a talk on wound infection, which was his primary interest. And he said, the great Theodore Coker, one of your countrymen, right? My friend. Your friend. He said, good, okay, good <laughs> enough. G gave a talk on wound infection and had something, and this is, sort of on my memory, had about four wound infections out of a great number of patients that he had looked after. He says, interestingly, he gave a similar talk a few years later, and he even forgot the four wound infections. So that, uh, that always became an issue. You want to comment on that? Well, I, I'm just, yes, I, I, I think that's true. I mean, but one of the, th one of the um, uh, routines uh, that um, uh, kind of made up for this is clinical records. And very often when people were writing up articles, they went back to the clinical records. But the problems go much deeper than that. They go into judgment. I mean, what constitutes improvement? What constitutes uh, cure? Uh, is, you know, is, is it, in, in, in the case of cancer surgery, is it six months? Is it a year? Is it five? I mean, there, there's an enormous amount of subjective judgment that goes into all of this stuff. Um, and uh, it can lead to very, very different results by different uh, people looking uh, at the evidence. Uh, Thomas, you're there. I have a question for you as someone who has looked at the history of the numerical method and its various incarnations over a long period of time. And it has to do with uh, our focus on surgery. So what from your perspective, looking at the, the various 
kinds of uh, numerical methods ending up with RCTs. Is there any role or anything that you could say about the role of surgery in that? So was surgery always marginal? Was it maybe a model? Was it something people said, oh, we do it in surgery, so let's do it for drug therapy too? I think it was the other way around, but maybe there are examples like that. Or was it uh, a reason to reject the numerical method uh, all around? So what is, is there something that from your perspective, uh, uh, your long-term perspective, that you could say about surgery? Is there anything specific, special? And the well, role I of spread of the spread of, of the numerical well, method. Well, I think I think that no, I, I don't think that surgery w was a model for for uh, uh, clinical trials per se, but I do think, as, as as I mentioned in the talk, that surgery was one of the areas where counting made most sense. It really made most sense to people because. Although there were all kinds of areas where you could debate. But still, death or survival is relatively unambiguous. And even if you could come up with objections, like you're intervening too early, right? And I mean, we see it today with, 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 you know, with cancer screening as well. We have the same kinds of arguments. You're intervening too early. Uh, and therefore, you know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the purported successes, uh, that, that being said, psychologically it doesn't make a difference. Psychologically, survival is survival and death is death. And it's very convincing in a way that mild improvement after taking a medication is not. So I would say that it would, it's, it's, surgery is extremely important for the survival and, and the, 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 uh, the capacity to convince uh, of counting uh, in the 19th and, and early, t early 20th century. Well, thank you very much. We have to now... Mm -hmm.